So what was your more question? So this is, so x to x squared, okay, and this is probably some function f of x, okay. Then? Compute f prime of x, okay. So then, what is the name uh, of the theorem required to do this? The fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus. So in particular, here it is. So if you have, uh, if you have, that you want to compute the derivative of the integral from h1 of x to h2 of x of f of t dt, like so, or maybe I'll call this G because we're already using an F up there, so I'll call this G. Okay, so this is the basic form that you're asked to do. You have some integral from one function of X to another function of X of some function of T dt. You want to compute the derivative of this thing with respect to X. Well, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, it is G evaluated at H2 of X. And then for the chain rule, you must multiply by the derivative of h2 of x, and then minus g evaluated at h1 of x, and then for the chain rule, multiplied by the derivative of h1 of x. So on the problem at hand, it should be something like this. The derivative is uh, what? So it will be x squared squared multiplied by the derivative of x squared and then minus x squared squared multiplied by the derivative of x. So this is what the answer should be, something like this. <coughs> okay, I'll leave the rest of it you, right? And these, these tick marks, right, you got to be really careful when you use the tick mark notation. This means derivative, not one. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Okay, wait, 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 it's too, too fast. I can't write that fast. Okay, so then a to x plus 4 is the second derivative, okay? Okay. Okay, so find... Well, probably, yeah, that's the first one, but probably they eventually want you to find f. Okay, so then now, you have the second derivative. You want to recover the first derivative. Okay, so then, this is one of the things, so here's two math sentences that we want you to be able to be very comfortable with. First, that, what is the derivative of the first derivative? The second derivative, right? Okay, so then that shouldn't be, shouldn't be a big uh, surprise. Okay, so then, what this is saying is this is saying the math sentence in the forward direction, in a sense, in the, in the direction that we taught you the first half of the semester. But you can do this, write this math sentence in another way. You can say that, well, the first derivative is the antiderivative of the second derivative. Okay, so how do you, how do you recover the, the first derivative from the second derivative? By an antiderivative. Okay. So then we can do that here. So the antiderivative of 8x plus 4, like so, dx, well, that is equal to 4x squared plus 4x, but now plus some unknown constant c, which I'll call c1. 
Okay, this is the first derivative. So in a sense, we know the first derivative, but only up to that constant C1. How do we figure out what C1 is? Yeah, now we use this piece of information. This information tells us how we can figure out C1. Specifically, <coughs> if you plug in negative 3, you should get 3. So 3 is 4 multiplied by negative 3 squared plus 4 multiplied plus 4 multiplied by negative 3 plus a constant C1. So 3 is equal to 36 minus 12 plus C1. So then you can see <laughs> from this equation that you could solve for C1. And then you have the first derivative. Okay, so then now you have the first derivative. How do you how do you recover the original function from the first derivative? Exactly the same way we just did this. <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Other questions? <laughs> okay. Find what? Because what the homework says is, the homework says find any antiderivative. Because how many antiderivatives are there? Infinitely many, right? You need to write plus c, because I will, say, I will say find the antiderivative, which means you need to signify to me that you understand that all antiderivatives differ by at most a constant. <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, other questions? Okay, so let's do one quick uh, integral involving logs so that, you know, we get, we remember that and then let's move on to something else. Okay, so does anyone have a specific one or shall I just choose one? Okay, so let's do one. This one will be entertaining. Okay, so then how about the integral from 1 to e of 1 plus the log of x squared and then divided by x uh, dx. What do you think? Substitution. I like it. Okay, so so what should we do? Make the top part u, but I, I don't I almost agree with that. Right, just one plus log x. Okay, so then specifically before I do that, to make sure everyone has a chance to see it and say aha in their brain, I'm gonna rewrite this just a little bit. One plus log of x squared and then instead of dividing by x I'm gonna say this is multiplied by 1 over x dx. Okay, so I want you to look at this and have an aha moment if you haven't already. <coughs> okay so then the proper substitution is to say that u is 1 plus the log of x. So I could have I could have just said u is the log of x. Could have done that. That would have been okay. okay. But can you see that it is more beneficial to say it's just 1 plus the log of x because you want u to gobble up as many symbols as possible. Okay, good. So 1 plus the log of x. So then uh, du, that will be 1 over x dx. I'll go ahead and change the limits now. So u evaluated at uh, 1. Well, that will be 1 plus the log of 1. And what's the log of 1? 0, right? Because recall the definition of the log is the area under the function 1 over t between t is 1 and t is x. So the area between t is 1 and t is 1 is 0, right? There's no area between those two. So this is just 1. So u of 1 is 1. And u of e is 1 plus the log of e. And we also said what the what the number e is. So what is the number e? 
with respect to the log function, that is. So log of e is what? Not 0, 1, right? Log of e is 1. e is the unique number that you, you're, if you recall the, that picture I drew about computing area under 1 over t dt, e is the number that when you push that right fence post far enough to the right, then the area under the curve is exactly 1. So that's 1 plus 1, so that's 2. Okay, so these are things you need to know because you're not going to have a calculator. Okay. So then, just to make sure things are clear, let's do a couple of these. How about what is the log of e to the fifth? 5. Right. So then that's a perfectly legitimate thing for me to ask you. You could get at it like this. So for example, using the laws of exponents for logs, that 5 can come out, and you can say, well, that's 5 multiplied by the log of e, the log of e, is 1, so that's 5. <coughs> okay, how about, how about what is the log of 1 over e cubed? Negative 3 for the same kind of reason, right? E, 1 over e cubed is e to the negative 3, so that's negative 3. Right? Okay. So any questions about this? Okay, so then continuing the calculus problem that we were doing here. So this is the integral from 1 to 2, and then what do we say this will be now? So 1 plus log, that becomes u, so u squared. And then 1 over x dx, well that's du, so u squared du. So then that's just u to the 3 over 3 evaluated from 1 to 2, so then that's what, 8 thirds minus 1 third, so 7 thirds. So any question about this question? <coughs> no, please leave it as 7 thirds. <laughs> please leave it as 7 thirds. So yeah, I mean, you know, one thing that I, one battle that I fight, you know, is this, is that, you know, there's like a Pavlovian response where students w sometimes want to say that, well, I'm going to call this 2 plus 1 third, okay, but, but it's even worse because in grade school they teach you not to write it like that, they teach you to write it like this, Right, but that's, that's not right, because in this math class, when you juxtapose two numbers, when you write them side by side, that doesn't mean plus. What does it mean? It means multiply. Okay, so this, I'm sorry, I don't care if your grade school teacher told you it was okay. This is college. It's not okay. Okay? <coughs> so any questions? <coughs> Please just leave it as seven-thirds, right? Please do that. <coughs> Okay, so any questions before we move on to something new? So now we find ourselves now we find ourselves in section 5.3, which is called inverse functions. So I'd like it to be clear why we're taking this sort of detour momentarily about into inverse functions. So we just got finished talking about logs the log function. And no math discussion about logs would be complete without a follow-up discussion about what? Exponentials, right? Exponentials. Because how are logs and exponentials related to each other? They're inverse. They're inverse functions. So we need to pause for just a minute and remind ourselves about the algebraic properties of inverses and then talk about some calculus properties of inverses for just a moment, and then we will be able to talk about the exponential function on Wednesday. Okay, so does everybody see what we're doing? So for, for Monday, we're going to talk about inverses because that allows us, for, allows us to talk about exponentials on Wednesday. Okay, so <coughs> we'll just jump right into it. This is the definition.
Okay. A function GL. So that's G sub L is said to be a left inverse. of f if <coughs> gl composed with f of x is so now <coughs> so now what should it be if if gl is an inverse of f that means that when you compose them what should you get you should get x right which means that here we have some function that you first do f and then you do gl and what what effect does that have on x none at all right okay to say that two functions are inverse means that you take something and nothing happens to it right so that you have done nothing to that element at all so this is <coughs> this is for each x in the domain of f okay similarly a function g r is said to be a so who can guess a right inverse of f of x of f if so now, how, how is the condition different? Yeah, so it'll be f of gr of x is what? Is x. Okay. This is for each x in the domain of gr. Okay, so then, the reason why the first thing is called a left inverse is because when you write it, G is on the left side of F, so that's called a left inverse. Okay, the GR is said to be a right inverse because in this order that you write it, okay, G is on the right side, so it's called a right inverse. So then, composition is a very important way to combine functions, right? You can combine functions with addition, you know, the sum of two functions or a product the product of two functions and you can compose functions too so one of the things that's important for you to understand is that composition is not commutative meaning okay, it matters what order you do it in right like pants and underwear it matters okay <laughs> okay unless you're Superman but no one in here is Superman I, I very strongly feel that so I'm wearing glasses <laughs> oh yeah we should just take them off now. No one in here is Superman. Okay, <clears throat> so then now, finally, finally, a function g <clears throat> is said to be an inverse, said to be an inverse of f if, if what? So, you get, so understand the way mathematicians do things, right? They always define things in terms of previous things. So tell me, a, tell me how to complete this sentence using the previous sentences. Ah, but I'm just talking about G now. So. Okay, so I'll finish the sentence. So if if G is a left and right inverse of F. So G is an inverse of F if it's a left inverse and it's a right inverse. So now, I'd like to point something out about this left and right stuff. 
So here, this sentence that I'm boxing right here, this says that G is a left inverse of F, or GL is a left inverse of F. So what about F with respect to G? What is F? F is a, a right inverse of GL. Right? Similarly, how about this? G, uh, F is a what? Is a left inverse of GR. Ah, so we have these relationships here. So tell me, if G is a left and right inverse of F, what does that imply about F? F is a, is a left and right inverse of G. Right? So if you have a function which has an inverse, right? so if you have like G is the inverse of F, then what is the inverse of G? F. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so does everybody sort of see that? Good. <coughs> Okay, so I'll write that down just as a consequence. So then, if G is the inverse of F, then F is the inverse of G. Okay, so then another thing that I'm going to write down but not not show well no first I'll show I'll show this because this will be important <laughs> okay so then now I have a question for you does every function have an inverse no every function doesn't have an inverse so this is something that you should have been demonstrated in uh, in a class before this so someone please tell me a function which does not have an inverse the square root function the square root function does have an inverse, but some, but you you're probably thinking of you're probably close. I think if you said square root function, how about how about okay absolute value doesn't. But I'm gonna make one. I'm gonna make this one because it's probably the easiest. So y is x squared. Okay, so then the plot of this function looks something like this. And using the, the means that you were given in a previous class, you should be able to tell me why this, okay, just imagine that's a good one. Why, why, the, why this doesn't have an inverse? You should be able to look at it by inspection and tell. Doesn't pass the horizontal line test. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Okay, so for example, here's a horizontal line. How many times does that horizontal line cross? Twice. Okay, so that means that this is not a this is not the graph of a function, or not the graph of an invertible function. So it has no inverse. Now, if I back that statement up just a little bit and say that okay, uh, let's consider another one. Y is x squared, but only for positive x's only for positive x's, then I can draw that much graph. Okay, that much graph will look like this. Like so. And then does that piece of graph pass the horizontal line test? Sure does. And what's the inverse of x squared when x is positive? The inverse function. The square root of x. The inverse of, of x squared is the square root of x when x is positive. Okay? So do you remember all of this? So then now, the point of me getting into that brief discussion is just to tell you that, well, some functions have inverses and some of them don't. Okay, but <coughs> I have some semi-good news. Okay, so then when f has an inverse, When it does have an inverse, then it is denoted like so, f superscript negative 1. So when it has an in inverse, it's denoted f superscript negative 1. And best of all, 
f inverse is unique. And so a function can have it might have an inverse and it might not. So it might have zero inverses. And if it does have an inverse, that's the only one. It doesn't have any others. Okay, wonderful. So any questions about this? Okay, so now let's worry about uh, computing some inverse functions. So specifically, we need to briefly mm, remember the geometry of what's happening. So then this is a graph inversion. Let's see, i got to see what time it is. Because I don't have my 31. Okay, so then now, what does it mean to compute a graph inversion? So good. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay, so then, if I give you a graph, <coughs> if I give you a graph, then its inversion, so this is not the, this is, this red thing is not the graph. This is the line y is x. Okay, so then here's a point right here. And let's, let's say this is the point AB. I want to find the inversion of this point. The inversion of this point. Okay, so then what, is, what does that mean? I need to do what? I need to reflect this point across the line y is x. So then I can go measure this orthogonal distance, right? This meets at a right angle, and then go that much further, okay, to about right there. This is the inverted point. And if my drawing was just perfect, then it might look slightly better. But what are one significant thing about this is that the coordinates of the, of the point before inversion was, are, is AB. Right, if you choose these coordinates. What, are, what is the coordinates of the inverted point? It is BA. BA. Right, because this is the line Y is X. Now, the, we have some geometric thing that's happened here. It's like, I, it's like I put my hand on that axis and sort of twisted it with my fingers and just flopped it over. So then what that means is that I've sort of moved this point across y is x to over here. Now, so what that means, algebra algebraically, what that means is you change the coordinates, right? You swap the, the x and y coordinates. So AB becomes BA. Wonderful. So any questions about that? So now, let's do another one. What if I draw a piece of graph? So how about something like this? So something that doesn't need to be a function. Okay, so let's invert this much, this blue piece of graph here. Okay, you don't need it to be a function to, to invert it. <coughs> okay, so let's start out with an easy one, relatively easy. Where does this point go? Right, it goes right here. No big deal. Okay, so then how about, how about this one right here? stays right there, right? Because if you, if you take that point that is on the line and you reflect it to the other side of the line, then it is still on the line, right? It doesn't move at all. It's right there. Okay, so can you see another point that doesn't move at all? Yeah, this one, right? That one doesn't move. Okay, great. How about, how about uh, this point right here? Where does it go? Right to the other side, something like this. Okay, and then maybe I'll do this one as well. So then that one goes to, you know, maybe approximately right here. Hard to tell with my eyes. Okay. So then <coughs> I'll sort of just connect the dots now. Right? So then connecting the dots looks something like this. Okay, 
up to my ability to draw. So then, <coughs> graph inversion, wonderful. So you can invert any graph. Okay, so any questions about this idea? Okay, so then algebraically, this tells you how to compute the inverse function of a, of a given function. So, uh, this one. So, given y is f of x, the inverse function satisfies, well, let's, let's back up. Let's back up just a little bit here. So first off, the inverse graph is f of y is x. So that's the inverse graph. Now the resulting thing may not be a function anymore. So for example, if you take the parabola, if you take a parabola, then you can compute its inverse graph. It has a perfectly legitimate inverse graph, but will that inverse graph be a function? No, it won't be. Right? Because if you take a parabola that opens up, say, and you compute its inverse, then it will open to the right, okay? and then such a thing will not pass the what? The vertical line test. It won't pass the vertical line test, so it's not, a, it's not a function. It's a graph, but not a function. So the inverse graph is that. Okay, so then if it is possible to, and this is sort of a loose statement, solve for y, then <coughs> Uh, the inverse graph is a function. Okay, so let's practice this for just a minute. So for example, for example, I could say um, how about y is equal to x plus 1 divided by 3x minus 2. x plus 1 divided by 3x minus 2. And my instruction to, for you is to compute, let's say it like this. This is f of x. I want you to compute f inverse. of x. So the way this goes is you say, okay, I'll write y is x plus 1 over 3x minus 2. Because this represents the graph. <coughs> now, in order to compute the inversion, right, geometrically that means that you are, you are flopping the graph over the line y is x, right? You are performing this rotation. So that's geometrically what, what's happening. Algebraically, what does that correspond to? Switching x and y, right? You, make, you turn y's into x's and x's into y's. So then, x is y plus 1 over 3y minus 2, right? This corresponds to the reflection across y is x. Okay, now what? Now you start solving for y. Okay, so then I'll multiply both sides. So x multiplied by uh, 3x, uh, 3y minus 2 <coughs> is equal to y plus 1. So then the left side, 3xy uh, minus 2x is equal to y plus 1. So now I'm going to move everything that has y 
<coughs> to the left hand side everything that does not have y to the right hand side so then 3xy minus y is equal to 1 plus 2x Okay, now you can see that the left hand side has a common factor of y so I can factor it out and say that it's y multiplied by 3x minus 1 is equal to 1 plus 2x and now I can divide both sides by 3x minus 1 to determine that y is equal to 1 plus 2x divided by 3x minus 1 okay so then now what does that mean we were able to solve for y so then what it's in, it's invertible right this is a function it's a, so the original function was invertible so what is the inverse function it's this thing 1 plus 2x over 3x minus 1 okay so then now let's really no let's not so then I'll tell you that you should <laughs> but we don't have time to do it right here so then now in this fun in this question I have two functions I have f and I have another thing that I'm claiming to be f inverse so then what should be true what should what should you get if you do this f composed with f inverse of x you should get x and what else should what else something like this should also happen yes and f inverse of f of x you should still get x okay so this would be something that I might ask you to do on the homework or something okay so any question about this so you know the inversion process basically is you can take any point and therefore any graph and then you can flop it across the line y is x this is called inversion okay so then algebraically this corresponds to turning x's into y's and y's into x's and then if you can furthermore solve for y after that procedure that means that the original function was invertible okay great <clears throat> so any question about this yes Yes? So the answer basically is not really. So then, so this is not, no longer part of the discussion of this question, but th generally there's functions that look like this ax plus b over cx plus d. Such functions are called Mobius functions. Okay, and in, since we don't have the diacritic O like that, it's often written like this in English, Mobius. So as it turns out, the inverse of a Mobius function is another Mobius function. So that's what you're seeing. So if you want to know more about it, you need to look up Mobius. But generally, uh, most functions aren't Mobius functions. <coughs> okay, good. So now... <coughs> two things two comments is that a function f has an inverse has an inverse if and only if f is one to one <clears throat> that is to say if I give you any two x values x1 and x2 so any two x values x1 and x2 if you plug them both into f and they're equal to each other this implies that x1 had to be equal to x2 <clears throat> f has an inverse if and only if this so then this right this statement is a mathematician's legal way to say the horizontal line test okay because what it's saying is that what does it mean 
what does it mean that I have two y values that are at the same height? Right? Two different y values at the same height. So that's like saying, okay, draw a graph and now you draw a line. What if I found two different two points that were at the same height? Then the only possibility is that they were the same point. Right? They weren't two different points, it was the same point. It cannot be that you find two y values, the same y value at two different x values. That's impossible. So that's, this is just a legal way to say the horizontal line test. Okay, and this is the mathematician's phrase is one to one. But, you know, if you get taught, <coughs> taught by someone that's from Europe or something like this, they won't say one to one, they'll say injective. Okay, just for those of you that are interested in this kind of thing. <coughs> Okay, so any questions about that? One to one. <coughs> okay, second. And this is the important one for, for this class. So this is sort of a little bit on the too legal side, too much legal for this class. But here's one that's perfectly fine. It is if F is strictly monotone. <clears throat> on its domain, then F is one to one and invertible. So, monotone, there are two kinds of monotone, so there's monotone increasing. Monotone increasing says that if x1 is less than x2, this implies that f of x1 is strictly less than f of x2. Okay, so then now you can probably use your imagination, right? Monotone decreasing means that if x1 is less than x2, then what? It's the other way, right? Yes, greater than. <clears throat> yeah, so then what this is saying is that these, these two things that I'm boxing in red, this is saying as you move to the right, right, from x1 to x2, the first one says the function goes up. The second one says the function goes down. Okay, so monotone increasing, mono, monotone decreasing. So then what if you have a function that's monotone, that's strictly monotone increasing or strictly monotone decreasing, then the function certainly is one to one, and therefore it is invertible, etc. Yes. The same what? Yes. Right. This is saying as you move to the right. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that purposefully. So this first sentence, the first math sentence says, as you go to the right the function goes up, right? The y values go up. This one says, as you go to the right, the y values go down. Right, so, so in the first case, you're going up as you go to the right, and the second case, you're going down as you go to the right. So monotone increasing and monotone decreasing. Okay, so then now, it can be pretty involved to determine if a function is one to one. But in this class, I can give you very simple examples of functions which are certainly monotone increasing or monotone decreasing, and you should be able to, to detect that immediately. So for example, how do you tell? I've ar you already know a way to see if a function is monotone increasing or decreasing. What is that way? Ah, it's derivative, right? If, if I give you a function that has a strictly positive derivative, then that function is monotone what? Increasing. And if I give you a function that has a strictly negative derivative, then that function is strictly what? Decreasing. Ah. So then, one thing that, that is common is this, is, you know, here I gave you an example of a function. I could say, uh, compute the inverse of this function. But another question I could say is, show me this function is invertible. Okay, now, if I say, show me this function is invertible, does that mean that you need to compute its inverse? No. No, it doesn't. Okay. 
No, it doesn't. That it's just show me that it's invertible. So if I give you a function and you compute its derivative and you show me that the derivative is strictly positive, then you can say it's monotone increasing and therefore invertible. Okay, you don't need to compute the inverse. So this really all comes to a head when I give a, an example of a question. I give you a function and you, and you do not know how to compute its inverse. I don't mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean like there is no inverse for. There's not a closed form way for you to compute the inverse, right? There's no way that you could do it legitimately. <laughs> but you can compute its derivative in a few lines and show me that the derivative is positive, and that wouldn't be a problem. So here's an example. <coughs> OK, so for example. Show that f of x is 1 fourth x cubed plus x minus 1 has an inverse. Oh, let's make it, yeah, OK, that'll be fine. Yeah, that's fine. OK, so then now, you could actually try and compute the inverse function of this, right, by swapping x's and y's and then attempting to solve for y. But that would be a cubic, right? So do you know generally how to solve cubics? And the answer is probably not. I mean, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I could look it up. I'm not even sure that I could solve it very easily or at all. But one thing I could do is say that, OK, the derivative, the derivative of this function is 3 fourths x squared plus 1. OK, now, 3 fourths, that's a constant, a positive constant multiplier. What's the smallest that x squared can ever be? 0, right? So this first term is greater than or equal to 0. And what's the smallest 1 can ever be? 1, right? OK, so then altogether, the, the smallest that the derivative can ever be is 1, right? So this is greater than or equal to 1, which is strictly positive. So what does that tell you? It tells you that f is strictly e increasing. Increasing. Which says that f of x is 1 to 1, or injective, whatever word you like. So then f of x is invertible. Okay, so every semester, I always get four or five attempts where students try and write pages and pages where they're trying to solve this cubic. Okay, so please don't be one of those students. Okay, so how are we doing on time? Oh, we're out of time. Okay, good. So see you on Wednesday. Mm -hmm.